what the hell is going on with China, I'll tell you something, things can't go on the way they are. The Prime Minister said at the end of last week, we'll always stand our ground when it comes to the things that we believe in and the values we uphold, unquote. That prompts the question, what price are we prepared to pay to maintain our sovereign values in dealing with China? We've noted the editor of the Global Times, the leading Chinese Communist Party publication, describing us as, and I quote, pieces of chewing gum on the sole of China's shoes. Last week, we had threats by China to bury Australian barley and meat exports. China have already slapped an 80% tariff on barley exports. But when you have the Chinese Communist Party rag, the Global Times telling us we're pieces of chewing gum on the sole of China's shoes, and then the same newspaper talked about threats to Australia's $63 billion iron ore exports only a week after, attacks on beef and barley producers, which of course threatens the livelihoods of thousands of Australians in regional and rural Australia, something has to give. Now, it's not just Australia. Denmark, France and Germany have been threatened by China with serious trade repercussions if Huawei's 5G ambitions in Europe are not honoured. In Germany, the Chinese ambassador warned that German cars could be, quote, deemed unsafe by Chinese authorities, unquote, unless Huawei is given the green light. Sweden's been warned of consequences if it awards a dissident Swedish-Chinese publisher a prestigious literary prize. The Chinese ambassador to Sweden told Swedish Public Radio in November, listen to this, quote, we treat our friends with fine wine, but for our enemies, we have shotguns. We've been outplayed, and it's important to be frank about that. You see, the idea sounded great at the time, in order to put political pressure on the Soviets and remove their primary Cold War ally, the United States would formally recognise Communist China in 1979 and legitimise them on the world stage. The plan was that as both countries benefited from closer economic and diplomatic ties, the Chinese would naturally liberalise and take their place as a responsible regional power with leading libertarian economists predicting transformation into a fully-fledged democracy by 2015. But wait a minute, you say, it's 2020 and they're not a democracy. In fact, China is as authoritarian as ever. She murders dissidents, steals intellectual property, violates international contract, conducts organ harvesting and ethnic cleansing, and has just exacerbated the spread of a deadly virus through incompetence and deception. Yes, that's right. You see, there was a tiny flaw in the plan. What was that, sir? It was bollocks. <laughs> and if rhetoric is anything to go by, people are finally waking up to the fact that we've become financially dependent on a mafia state, basically, and this new world order threatens much of what we say we care about. Donald Trump has responded to the pandemic with his usual theatrics, announcing that China will pay big time. The British Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, has called time out on business as usual once the dust settles, and even President Macron of France has said that Europe will need to focus on regaining its economic sovereignty. But I don't really care about what people say, I care about what they do. And so I thought I'd take this time to speculate on potential ways forward and get a bit of a discussion going, because how we respond to this, and by we I mean the free world, could easily determine the order of the globe for the next 100 years and beyond. There are only three possible responses when all said and done, broadly speaking. First, do nothing. Reinstate the pre-pandemic status quo, cuck into the shadows, and quietly acknowledge that the American century is over, and the Chinese basically call the shots. We've sold our soul for 30 pieces, and like a prize fighter who's been retired 20 years, we're content to simply get fat and drunk while a new superpower shapes the world in their image. It's possible, 
But the good news, from my perspective at least, is I actually don't see that happening for a couple of reasons. First of all, the consequences of the current pandemic are much harder to ignore than the arrest of some bookseller on the island of Hong Kong, right? I mean, the antics in Africa, the bullying of the Philippines, all of that can easily be spun as remote and none of our business. Now, I don't agree with this perspective. I care about those issues and I wish more people would. But the reality is the shoddy gangsterism of the CCP is now affecting the West directly. The UK is set to enter the worst recession for 300 years and American unemployment is pushing 40 million. The global economy may shrink by 5.5% this year, which is roughly three times the damage it sustained during the financial crisis of 2008. You don't just ignore that. Right? Now, how much of this damage is the fault of the CCP is a subject for debate, but that they are responsible for some of it is undeniable, and world governments will want some compensation for that. More importantly, however, this pandemic has revealed the dark side of globalism, and that is, it entails vulnerability. Mutual dependence is fantastic when practiced between nations with similar values, who will look out for each other and play by the rules. One-way dependence on a hostile autocracy and geopolitical rival, on the other hand, is complete folly. It grants our enemies leverage and the power to coerce us, and I think the general public understand that now. So I could be wrong, but my instinct tells me that an end to business as usual is indeed on the cards, and I'm pleased about that. The second option is essentially to burn it all down, and I've seen some people advocate for this pretty energetically. We should stop all trade with China, throw them out of the WTO, impose high tariffs, cancel the debt, and, and look, I'm not above indulging in aggression of this kind from time to time. I was ribbing Boris Johnson on Twitter the other day, in fact, saying something to the effect of, if you don't declare war on China by Christmas, I'm joining the Labour Party or some such fucking nonsense, right? And we all need to let off steam from time to time, but practically speaking, there are a whole host of reasons why lashing out like that would be foolish and self-destructive. For a start, supply chains. They are currently such that the United States relies on China for up to 80% of its medical goods. And we're in the middle of a global pandemic, in case you forgot, right? <laughs> and it doesn't stop there. Uh, what about electronics? What about furniture, textiles, toys? Most of this stuff is made in China. And Beijing also controls 73% of the world's lithium. <laughs> you think you can just cut them off? or Nukem, as somebody suggested in the comment section of one of my previous videos. I mean, aside from that just being morally insane, does the phrase pissing in the wind mean anything to you? I mean, it would be like hacking at the support of a rope bridge, right, that you yourself are standing on. For example, factories on the scale we would need to replace the existing ones in Shanghai or, or Canton, they can't just be built overnight. And international consensus towards a policy of economic reorientation takes time to cement. To use an analogy, right? A person doesn't become obese in a day. And believing we can simply say, screw it, uh, sever all ties, I mean, it's as stupid as believing that same obese man can build a body like Schwarzenegger after one session of chest and back, right? It's preposterous. 
But luckily, there's a third way, a better way. We don't need to be suckers, and we don't need to be sociopaths. We need to be smart. That's what we need to be. And much like the CCP, who have had a geopolitical strategy to expand Chinese dominance since they first took power under Mao, the West could develop and sustain a long-term strategy that is essentially the opposite, right? A strategy that contains China and maintains the Anglo-American sphere as the world hegemon, essentially. So how would we go about doing that? Well, to my lights, you may do so in no less than three ways. Okay, first and foremost, diplomacy. Good old-fashioned hearts and minds. For example, the CCP is attempting to transform themselves into the great hero of this pandemic, you may have noticed, rather like an arsonist who slips subtly into a fireman's jacket after setting your house ablaze. Do not allow this, okay? His own mishandlings aside, Donald Trump is absolutely right to keep much of the blame where it belongs, and that is with the Chinese Communist Party, and other world leaders should join him in that sentiment. Control the narrative, not just on this, but on every issue. I want to see European presidents calling out Xi Jinping for human rights abuses publicly and regularly. I want to see Boris Johnson at the PMQ dispatch box with the flag of Hong Kong pinned to his lapel. And I want to see Western embassies move from Beijing to Taipei. Because I'll tell you something, the fact that we grant the CCP political legitimacy by engaging in full diplomatic relations with them is not only morally gross, it undermines our own claim to value freedom and democracy. It makes us hypocrites, is what it makes us. And this hypocrisy is now becoming dangerous. Instead, we should be empowering our allies in the region, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and even India, a country of a billion people, lest we forget that Britain is uniquely placed to leverage as head of the Commonwealth. I'll come on to trade in a minute, but politically speaking, we should have nothing to do with China until their people are free, and we should be denouncing and undermining the regime at every turn, at every turn. It shows strength, unity, principle, <laughs> that old-fashioned nugget, <laughs> and moral authority. It shows leadership, and leadership inspires. Now, secondly, from an economic standpoint, we have to diversify our supply chains. And this is just <laughs> obvious, right? And it will take years of discipline and resolve, but it's absolutely essential. The good news is there are plenty of options, right? Indonesia, Bangladesh, Mexico, Brazil, right? and of course, our own countries, especially when it comes to essentials like medical supplies. I mean, we should be producing that ourselves. The Americans wouldn't outsource their military equipment to some rival state, would they? They wouldn't ask China to build them a fighter jet. So why are they asking her to build ventilators and face masks, honestly? It's crazy. And some countries, thankfully, are already doing this. Japan have set aside 2.5 billion US dollars to assist their companies in shifting production out of China. And the British, I'm proud to say, are drawing up something known as Project Defend, <laughs> very aptly named, to end UK reliance on China for all strategic imports. This is good. Right? Other countries need to follow suit. And on the other side of the coin, I would also work 
to eliminate the presence of Chinese state-owned businesses in the West entirely. Any company that is controlled directly by the CCP should be repatriated, including the Confucius Institutes. They can't be trusted and we shouldn't be financing them, even if they could be, <laughs> to be honest. Again, a policy of this kind would require time and caution to implement, but the obvious place to start is with Huawei, the telecoms company. The US, Japan, Australia and Vietnam were quick to deny Huawei the opportunity to build their 5G networks, and I'm delighted that the UK has finally seen sense on the issue and joined them in that commitment. Many of you will know I made a video about this uh, a few months ago, decrying Boris's intention to give Huawei a role in UK 5G. He's U-turned, it's fantastic news, and I sincerely hope that France and Germany make the right decision here too. They may not be part of the Five Eyes, but they're close allies, there are European partners, and in addition to potential security threats, they should be working with us now to put as much pressure on the CCP's purse strings as possible. Last but not least, the military. It is vital that NATO keep theirs strong and vigilant. As the post-pandemic strategy kicks in, and the effects are felt, I fully expect Xi Jinping to become desperate and start flailing. It's what dictators always do when they begin to lose influence, and the obvious target is Taiwan. We're already beginning to see tensions escalate in this regard. We should be selling them any weapons they want, and we should be prepared to fight for them also, if needs be. Now, this requires not only political will on the part of the United States, of course, but I would argue that Britain and France need to step up as well. What is Europe doing, by the way? Why did I read a report recently by the British Ministry of Defence that confirmed the strength of our armed forces has declined for the ninth consecutive year? And this is under a Tory government, right? The party of Churchill and Wellington, right? Now, by all accounts, the training is still world class, and I respect the troops, but we have a standing army of 80,000 men. To put that in perspective, that's 20,000 less than the Germans were allowed under the conditions at Versailles. It's pathetic. Right? It reminds me of that old Bismarck joke actually, when someone asked him, I think it was Bismarck, what he would do if the British landed troops in Germany. Do you know what he said? I just have them arrested. One think tank described us as possessing a critical shortage of artillery and ammunition, which would make it impossible to maintain a credible defence position. And I doubt that the French are in much better shape. It's not fair that America should have to do all of the heavy lifting in this regard. And I know Americans aren't going to want to hear this, but as China develops in capability over the next 50 years, they might not be able to. Okay? The whole point of NATO is that free countries work together to defend our values. And that means every member of the team needs to pull their weight. So that's it, essentially. Those are the tools in the toolkit. Diplomacy, economics, and military deterrent. And we should deploy them all with confidence and resolve. Now, I don't expect that to happen you understand, and I don't expect anyone to listen to me, but that's what I would do.